Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. My name is Harpreet Singh. I'm a first year here at Harvard College and a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee here at the Institute of Politics. Before we begin, please note the exit doors which are located on both the park side over here and the JFK street side of the forum over here. In the event of an emergency, please walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in the JFK park. Also, please now take a moment to silence your cell phones. You can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag Santos Forum, which is also listed in your program. Please take your seats now and join me in welcoming our guest, President Juan Manuel Santos and tonight's moderator, Professor Nicholas Burns. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Nick Burns, professor here at the Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum. It is a great, great pleasure to welcome a great international leader, President Juan Manuel Santos, to Harvard. Let's give him another round of applause. <laughs> so um, it's going to be a great honor for me to um, interview um, President Santos, and then uh, we're going to give all of you an opportunity to ask questions of him. There are two microphones on this floor, there are two microphones on these two balconies, and when we get to that point of the conversation, if you want to ask a question, just please stand uh, behind the microphone, identify yourself, make sure there's a question mark attached to the end of your question, and we'll have an interesting evening. Uh, we have a lot of special guests here uh, this evening. Uh, President Felipe Calderon was the very first Angelopoulos Presidential Fellow here at Harvard, and he's back. And we want to welcome President Calderon <laughs> back to Harvard. <laughs> it has been a great pleasure for us to spend this entire week with a great leader from Senegal, the former Prime Minister of Senegal, Dr. Aminata Touré, please. And one of the unsung heroes of American diplomacy back in the George H.W. Bush administration, but also more recently as an advisor to President Santos on the historic negotiations in Colombia was Ambassador Bernie Aronson. Bernie, thank you. <laughs> President Santos, as you all know, is president of Colombia 2010 to 2018 now a private citizen. What an extraordinary career and what a role model for our students here at Harvard. Think of this public service, not just president for eight years, Minister of National Defense, which is where I first met President Santos about a de more than a decade ago when I was working with the Colombian government on Plan Colombia, Minister of Finance, the first Minister of Foreign Trade when the economy was being opened up back in the 1990s. He was also a journalist and also a publisher of El Tiempo, someone who is courageous in what he said at difficult times. Author of several books, including a book on the Third Way with Tony Blair of the United Kingdom. I think for our purposes, Mr. President, when we think about you and your legacy, it's this big risk that you took to start negotiations. Your country was divided. Your country had gone through this terrible crisis for decades. You took a risk in negotiating with the FARC but that risk paid off. You brought peace to your country. You brought reconciliation to it. And for that, and for a lifetime of service, you were awarded the 2016 Nobel Peace Prize, which is really the greatest honor that can be bestowed on a president or on a diplomat. Maybe a little bit less importantly, graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School, but that's still a pretty significant thing. <laughs> <laughs> alumnus of our Neiman Fellowship Program, and now part of the Angelopoulos Presidential Fellow Program, we bring, like President Calderon, we bring former presidents and prime ministers here. They spend time with our students, uh, and President Santos will be coming back in what we call here charitably the spring semester. It's really the winter semester. Um, you'll be coming back to spend time with us. We look forward to that. 
So what a career. And I think my first question, um, President Santos, would be, uh, we'll just start with the local question. You've been at Harvard at various stages of your life as a young man, after the University of Kansas, you came here, you came back as a journalist, now you're back as a heralded statesperson. What has Harvard meant to you? Well, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. It's a great honor, a great pleasure to be back at the forum at the Kennedy School. And uh, I only have good memories of my years at Harvard, first as a mid-career MPA at the Kennedy School, then as a Neiman Fellow. Um, I, uh, I was uh, taught uh, basic important things like uh, the first tools of negotiation. I remember a great teacher called Roger Fisher. Sure. I became a very good friend of Roger Fisher. And one of his successors, uh, William Udi, was one of my advisors now in the peace process. But most importantly, I think what Harvard gave me was uh, uh, a critical way of thinking. Um, to, to think uh, with a much more open perspective. Uh, to it, it sort of broaden my mind to under th understand things uh, uh, better. And I, I think that this phrase that your uh, recent uh, designated president of Harvard used in a speech, a great speech that he made a couple of weeks ago, that the university or Harvard should teach you to understand quickly and judge slowly. It's yeah. a great phrase. Yeah. And I think Harvard taught me that, to understand things more quickly, but to be very slow on making judgments because there are so many ways of looking at the same thing. Therefore, don't precipitate and make judgments without the proper analysis. And I'll bet you came from this extraordinarily difficult situation when you were minister and then you became president of a country that had been truly divided by war, by kidnapping, the drug wars, the terrorism, the violence. So that uh, when, you, when you came into the presidency, at what point did you decide that you had to do, frankly, what your predecessors had not been able to do, although many of them tried, and try to unite the country through diplomacy and end that war? What was the crucial decision point? It's a story that goes back 50 years. I was in the Colombian Navy, and uh, I remember very well, because it was a very important lesson, that one of the officers took me and two other the, of the recruits, and they gave us a sailboat. I said, go and learn how to sail. We had no idea of how to sail, and we had lots of trouble. And he taught us how to sail. And he taught us that sailing is, to sail, you have to have a port of destiny. You have to know where you're going. And if you know where you're going, you can use all the winds in your favor. And he said, this is good for sailing, but this is good for life in general. And use this lesson. And that lesson I re remember very well. But then the challenge was, what is my port of destiny? Where should I try to uh, go? And maybe two anecdotes in my life told me your port of destiny is to seek peace for your country. One was in a conference when I had just been appointed minister, first minister of foreign trade. One of my responsibilities was to open the economy. That was back in the 90s, early 90s. And I went to New York and I prepared a, a big conference for investors to attract them to Colombia, because if you open the economy, you need investment. And we were in the middle of the conference, and suddenly s some news came that there was a huge bomb in a commercial center in Bogota. Of course, trying to sell a country that uh, is full of bombs was very difficult, and I remember very well that one of the CEOs of a big company 
came to me and to the then Minister of Finance that w w was with me in the conference, and he said, Ministers, if you really want to attract investment in Colombia, you must finish that war. That was something that impressed me a lot. And s a couple of years later, I was chairing, I was the chairman of the United, uh, the UNCTA, the United Nations Conference for Trade and Development, right. the eighth conference. Yep. And uh, Nelson Mandela had been elected for the ninth conference. So I had to go to South Africa to give him the chair. And I went. And I had a 15-minute meeting with him, programmed. And I sat down with him, and we talked for six and a half hours. And um, he, he was an extraordinary man. Um, I remember that that morning, I had turned on the television in South Africa, and I saw something which really impressed me was live television, the victims and the perpetrators meeting each other, accusing each other. And I asked Mandela, what is this? And he said, this is a way to heal so many years of violence and of war. And he, he started talking about peace and about the necessity to end violence. And he told me, your country, you should dedicate your life as I dedicate my life to have peace in your country. And then I found then my port of destiny. And since then, I started uh, studying the different peace processes. Uh, what lessons could we in Colombia uh, learn, the good ones, the bad ones, the peace processes that we had had and had failed, what went wrong, what went right. And uh, there, slowly, I started to identify certain conditions that were necessary for a successful peace process. I helped uh, create those conditions as Minister of Finance, as Minister of Defense, and when I was elected, I then um, dedicated myself to construct the other conditions, like for example, what, what were the four conditions that were necessary? You need to have the upper hand in the military correlation of forces. Uh, because if the other part thinks that they're going to win, they will never negotiate in good faith. You need to have the commanders, in this case of the guerrillas, personally interested in peace, that they will be better off in the long run with peace than with continuing the war. The s third condition was the support of the region. In today's world, any what we call asymmetrical war will not be resolved without the support of the region. And that for me was a big problem because I had very bad relationship with Chavez in Venezuela and with Correa in Ecuador. But there's a, an expression in Colombia, I had to eat that frog. You know, <laughs> that means I had to and make peace with both, and right. we made, and, and that helped a lot. I must say it helped a lot. And the fourth condition was to recognize that there was a conflict, because that was necessary to be able to apply what was called transitional justice, the international uh, penal court, uh, the Statute of Rome, they authorize the member countries or the countries that are um, negotiating a peace to apply a different kind of justice from the ones we all are accustomed to. And this is necessary, a necessary condition for peace. So when once we had the four uh, conditions ready, I launched the process. Now, it was very difficult uh, because I was warned that I had been a very effective hawk as Minister of Defense uh, to gain the condition of weakening my opponents, and that I was elected because I was a very effective hawk, and that suddenly I was going to sit down as a dove. That transition is very difficult to explain. 
And I remember a person who was with me this morning, he went back to Tel Aviv, a former minister of foreign relations of, of uh, Israel, who was one of the architects of Camp David, Shlomo Ben Ami. Yeah. He told me, President, you can maintain your very high popularity. I, was, I won the first election with the highest amount of votes uh, ever in the, in the Colombian election because I was successful making war. Uh, and you can maintain that as long as you win. If you lose, you will be in trouble, but you're good at it and you can maintain it. But you can also lose your political capital. You can even lose your life, like uh, what happened to Rabin or to Sadat. But that's the only way you will achieve peace in a negotiating table. You take the decision. I took the decision to go the difficult way. It was very difficult. Effect effectively, people did not understand, they still don't understand, many of them, why I switched from being a hawk to being a dove. But the, the, the path was the correct path and now we have peace. And so uh, I would say that it, to be able to do that, uh, you have to have a goal port of destiny, a strategic goal uh, for this or for many projects in life, you have to have flexible tactics. You, know, you have to be able to accommodate to the, cir to the circumstances, and then you have to have certain characteristics depending on the process or depending on, on your objectives, uh, perseverance, uh, the courage to take risks, uh, compassion, to feel the pain of others, um, and you combine these elements, uh, then you will make any conflict uh, a conflict that is possible to resolve. I, I am now convinced people in Colombia, when I took the decision, said, you're crazy. All of your predecessors have failed and this is going to be a very costly for you. Why do you do it? You've been successful making war. Um, and uh, uh, they were wrong. Uh, this conflict was resolved, and I think that with goodwill and persevering and with the right conditions, any conflict in the world can be resolved. Thank you. Um, so this is interesting. You had the original vision come out of this meeting with this great leader, Nelson Mandela to change your society and to bring peace. You had uh, the correlation of forces. You'd been defense minister. You'd turn the tables on the FARC. You helped me. We tried. Plan Colombia. We helped tried. Me. Yeah. That was President <laughs> Clinton and President George W. Bush. And it was a long-term program to oh, help you. And, help your and, and I would say it's, the, it's been the most successful bipartisan foreign policy initiative the U.S. has had in the last 40 years. Yeah, and I think we all feel proud of it, that two different administrations, yeah. two parties, two different Congresses were able to sustain this program of economic support, political support, military support. But you had all this, but then you had to make, I mean, you were the decided, des decider, the decision maker, and you couldn't be sure, I imagine, that the FARC would actually get to the end of the negotiations, that they were serious. You couldn't be sure that the people of Colombia would accept reconciliation. You couldn't be sure that people like President Oribe, uh, your predecessor, would support it. So you took a lot of risks. You had to balance risk and reward. Talk about that. Well, yes, uh, there were a lot of risks. Um, the possibility of success was not very big. I came into the process with a very high degree of skepticism because of what the FARC had done before and because of what had happened in other processes. But then I started testing the FARC. Are they uh, nego negotiating seriously this time or not? For example, one specific test was uh, we're going to negotiate the agenda. This is a crucial aspect of any negotiation. It's going to be a very short agenda. It's not going to be to uh, 
redefine the government or the state or the, or the country. It's to end the conflict. So what we're going to do is to build a, a golden bridge for the FARC to lay down their arms and reintegrate into politics. For the first time ever, uh, abiding by international law, the Statute of Rome, uh, and that's our agenda. But you cannot, and I told the FARC, two things. You cannot leak one single word of what we're doing. They had always leaked, because that would uh, embarrass the, go the government and weaken the government in the face of public opinion. And I said, you are leak one word, I will stand up and finish the negotiation. They maintained the secrecy for a year and a half until we, uh, we announced the, the, uh, that we had an agenda. The second test was even harder. I decided, and that was very risky and very unpopular, to apply what I call the Rabin Doctrine. What is the Rabin Doctrine? Yeah. The former president of Israel, uh, Rabin, said at one time, I will negotiate with Arafat, with the terrorist, as if there is no terrorism. And I will continue fighting terrorism as if there is no peace process. Separate the two. And I decided that I will apply that doctrine to this peace process. And I said to the FARC, we will continue the war until we are very close to a total deal. And nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And they accept it. And suddenly, one day, I remember very well because the board of directors of uh, Conservation International was in Colombia, in Cartagena. I was receiving them. Suddenly, I received a call from uh, the army commander. We have located the number one of the FARC, Alfonso Cano. He was our highest value target. We had a list of high value targets. It was the highest. We had already started exchanging um, messages, he and I. And I had to take the decision if I went after him or not. And one of the decisions, one of the factors that uh, was very important in taking that very difficult decision was uh, they will respect me because the rules of the game must be applied. And I had told them the rules of the game, and I specifically told them, will allow you to kill me because you've been trying for the last 50 years, and me to kill you. It's, it's very blunt, but very real. And so I decided, I told the commander, please try to capture him, knowing that he would never allow him to be captured alive. And he was shot. And uh, I was praying to see if that would simply undo the process, they met, uh, they, they then after said, this guy is a tough guy, but we must continue. And they respected me more for that decision than before. That's what they tell me mm, some years after. So it was these type of decisions that you have to make in a process as difficult, always on the verge of, of failure, many times I failed. I even failed when I put the agreement to the Colombian people. I, I lost the referendum. And there I said, uh, after six years, I, I, I simply cannot allow six years of negotiation. We already have a, an agreement. It's already signed. Uh, no, we have, we're saving millions of lives. Uh, I can't allow this to simply go down the drain. So I, what I did was uh, say, apply like the Chinese proverb, uh, find an opportunity in every crisis. I, I found an opportunity. Let's make a, 
a better agreement, a stronger agreement, and that's what we did. Yitzhak Rabin was criticized in 1993 and 94 for negotiating with Yasser Arafat. You were criticized for negotiating with the FARC. Rabin said to justify his negotiations, he also said, um, you don't negotiate with your friends, you negotiate with very unsavory enemies. That was your decision and the right decision. You also had an international support network, which was an interesting network because you had Cuba, the Cuban government supporting you, and you had a former American ambassador who's right here with us, Bernie Aronson. You had Bill Urey from Harvard. How did that work out, and, and how important was that for you? That was fundamental because I had a strong opposition inside the country. Yeah. Uh, as Mandela had it in his country, yeah. as the Northern Ireland negotiators had it in, in Northern Ireland. Very definitely. And so the, the support of the region and of the international community was crucial. And that was made, and you are a very good and expert diplomat, through diplomacy, through bringing uh, the countries into the process. I remember when I told President Obama uh, we were having the summit of the Americas. He went to Cartagena, and he was the first person to be informed of my intentions, and he was very generous, said, this is the best thing you can do, you have all my support. Um, I had already brought in Chavez and Correa and Cuba. Cuba was, at that time, flirting with the U.S. They wanted yeah. to have some kind of uh, rapprochement, and the U.S. also. Yeah. So the Colombian peace process was a very good excuse for the Cubans to, in a way, wash their face. Now, instead of being revolutionaries, uh, now we are peacemakers. And uh, I knew that, and in a way I utilized them for that, but they were very, very effective. Um, the Europeans were always been very pro-peace, and they said this is the last armed conflict of the whole Western Hemisphere, this is something we will support. They were on board all of the European countries. Um, then I had to also seek the support of China and Russia as members of the Security Council, which was going to be the the, the, the decision-making uh, 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 instance that, that will support the whole process, for example, in verification, which they did afterwards. Um, and all the um, uh, the ceasefire procedures, all what the United Nations does in these type of situations. So it was a delicate uh, diplomatic architecture which worked very well. And again, to answer the question, it was fundamental. Without the international support, I would uh, probably n would not have resisted the internal opposition. And. Um while you're with us over the next year, one of your priorities will be to look at peace negotiations and try to derive some lessons from it. In fact, I think you've been meeting with Bernie and others the last day. Uh, that's, uh, you're going to take that forward and try to see if it can be applied to other parts of the world. We, we already started. Good. Um, yesterday and today, uh, we had a very unique uh, group of advisors. Uh, I decided that I would bring in fresh blood with people who had hands-on experience in peace processes. So I, bring, I brought in Shlomo Benami, yeah. who, who had a very uh, good experience in the Arafat uh, and the Palestinian-Israeli uh, accords. I brought in uh, Joaquin Villalobos, who had been a commander of the Salvadorian guerrilla, who is now a professor of Oxford. Uh, as an advisor, I brought in uh, um, the chief of staff of Tony Blair, who was yeah. his main uh, main negotiator in the Northern Ireland peace process. Uh, I I brought in a professor of Harvard to give us the the um, uh, sort of theoretical uh, input, uh, which is William Murray, yeah. and, and they were extremely useful. Uh, then President Obama uh, appointed Bernie Aronson as special envoy. To the, to the talks, 
and Bernie had had experience in in El Salvador, and he was very very effective in in pushing the negotiations and and showing where we had to work a bit harder, where should we be more restrained. It was a it was a great advi a great advisor and a great uh, sort of facilitator. So was uh, uh, the Europeans also named a special envoy, some uh, Anne uh, Gilmore from he was a former minister of foreign yeah. affairs of Ireland. So the this was a a, a very unique uh, process with very unique characteristics. It's the only process where the two parts get together create a justice system and then accept to uh, they accept to submit to this justice system this had never been done before it's the first process where the victims of the war are put in the center of the solution of the uh, negotiations their rights their rights to uh, the truth their rights to reparation, their rights to justice, their right to non-repetition. That became the pillars of the negotiation. Uh, no other agreement ever had done this before. So we have become sort of a test case and a precedent. And what we have been doing the last two days was to give it a, an academic context, because many of the professors you have here, uh, one of them wrote a book with you, about Kissinger, Jim Sabanius. Uh, uh, they yeah. they were there present, giving us sort of the academic uh, uh, framework to be able to use this in other in other uh, areas, in other uh, conflicts, and I think we will continue to do that. And we're really honored by that, and we, and we look forward to helping you whatever way we can. You're also going to be looking at two other issues here at Harvard: fighting poverty and fighting the worst aspects of climate change. You might want to tell us about that. Well, fighting poverty. What a coincidence that I have President Calderon here. Um, when I was uh, elected president, the first thing I did, or one of the first things, the same, the same week, is fly to, to Oxford, Great Britain, and see a former professor who had been a professor, my professor here in Harvard, and also in at the LSE, who was then afterwards awarded the Nobel Peace, uh, the, not, uh, the Nobel Economic Prize, the uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, yes. uh, Amartya Sen. Yeah. He, I remember very well, he was passionate about fighting poverty in a different way, uh, with a measuring it in a different way. He said the World Bank and the IMF, and they have simply a measurement about how much you you earn. That's a wrong way to measure and a wrong way to fight poverty. So I said to him, why don't we, uh, why don't you help me apply your theories and I am ready to do it in my country. And he sent a big team and uh, uh, President Calderon uh, said, I want to be in, uh, in, in, in this uh, process also. So the two countries that were pioneers in the application of what is called the multi-dimensional index to fight poverty were Mexico and Colombia. And we have been very successful in reducing poverty in the last seven years in Colombia. We have been able to reduce, uh, to uh, take five and a half million Colombians out of poverty. And why is this so uh, useful? Because it gives the government um, a much better idea of where to invest in order to have a, a bigger impact on fighting poverty. So uh, Professor Sen wants me to continue promoting this. Now about 60 countries are wanting to do this uh, in around the world. And the, the other aspect that uh, I'm very interested in is climate change and, and the SDGs. Colombia was the country who proposed the, uh, develop the Sustainable Development Goals in, in Rio Janeiro in the summit of, year, of the year 2012. That came about because two magnificent young women, one used to work in the Ministry of Education, another in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, came to me and said, Mr. President, 
the millennium goals will be over. They must be replaced. But it's not just, it's not fair that all the burden should be on the poor countries. Why are not the developed countries also required to chip in an effort, especially now that the big challenge is the environment? And I said, I think it's a good idea. And then we went to Rio, we made the proposal, and like many ideas, uh, some click, some don't click, this one clicked. I remember the Chinese delegation, the British delegation coming to me and said, this is a great idea. And they start pushing and they become the world agenda in the year 2015 in the United Nations. And so I want to, to continue with, with that because I, I am very worried and you all should be worried uh, of what is happening with climate change. President Calderon has become uh, a, a big uh, promoter of the fight against uh, climate change. He knows now better than anybody else how dangerous this is for all of us. And, and we, me we must make the world much more conscious of the need to act fast. This uh, report that was published uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, just last Monday. It's a devastating report. Yeah. We were talking with President Calderon about uh, the coral reefs, uh, which uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, an interesting anecdote. When we were discussing the uh, SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, how many goals, what goals, suddenly somebody came to me and said, you and uh, w I was working together with the then British Prime Minister David Cameron, uh, very closely, we became very good friends, and they said, you are doing everything wrong. And I said, why? Um, and they said, what do you think is the most important investment to preserve the planet? And I said, um, planting trees. And he said, no, that's the number two. The number one is preserving the coral reefs. And it's 10 times, 10 times more, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, multiply, the more, no, no, more rentable, more profitable from the, from the <laughs> but not, not, the, not the money from the environmental point of view, 10 times more, more profitable uh, to preserve the coral reefs than to preserve the trees, to preserve the planet. Anyway, this is a, a, ver a, a small anecdote in this huge challenge that we all have, because when I say all, it's uh, we are one human race uh, and we are one world. One of the great opportunities for our students here is that, you know, so President Santos has identified three big priorities for his time at Harvard with us. Pitch in, send him your ideas, volunteer. Uh, to help him out. This is a great opportunity, I think, for our students. I have two more questions, then we're going to go to all of your questions. Venezuela. You and I yesterday had a long discussion about Venezuela. This, this wealthy country, now in economic ruin, political division, I would say disastrous leadership. That's just my own personal view. And then you hear these calls, sometimes from the opposition, sometimes inside the White House. Should the U.S. intervene, which I think is a disastrous notion. What should we, the international community, what can we do to help the people of Venezuela? This is worse than a disaster, and worse than a catastrophe. There's, I was trying to find a, a word that would describe something worse, but there isn't, but it's worse. <laughs> right. And it's in the richest country in Latin America. It has the biggest oil reserves of the whole world, more than Saudi Arabia. And uh, today the people are dying of hunger. They're dying because they don't have the most elementary medicines. Uh, and uh, Colombia is the country that is receiving uh, a big part of the cost because we have m more than one million uh, refugees coming into Colombia. Inside Colombia. Yeah. Well, tremendous pressure on our health system, on our education system, something that I been trying to stop. I, I did all my best until the last uh, day of my government, and I hope this government continues to stop the 
the natural xenophobia that emerges when you see uh, this amount of people coming into your country and start competing for your jobs and for uh, the uh, beds in the hospitals. And, uh, th there's a natural reaction. Uh, I've been trying to, to stop that. I've been saying to my compatriots, these are our brothers. They're having trouble. Uh, let's help them. Uh, this situation will be fixed sooner or later. And then the big question is, how soon and how is it going to be fixed? When I say that this is worse than a disaster because unfortunately, and you are a good negotiator, um, words like dialogue have been completely devalued. When you say, let's, let's dialogue, let's establish a dialogue between X and Y, nobody wants to sit down in dialogue because the system and the regime and what has happened and also the opposition has been responsible of devaluing uh, the common traditional tools to fix these type of conflicts. So you have to start by uh, remaking the tools, by revaluing the value of dialogue. And then I would say that Venezuela is like a, a, a plane that runs out of fuel. You can have a soft landing or the plane can crash. I truly believe that it is in the interest of everybody to seek a soft landing. But in order to be able to do that, you need to address the major stakeholders, which some of them have not been addressed yet. Um, by major stakeholders are, of course, the Venezuelan regime, of course, the opposition, of course, the countries of the region, of course, the United States, but also China, also Russia, also Cuba. Cuba has a big say in what Maduro does or, or doesn't do. Um, and you need, again, using what we did in Colombia, you need to build this uh, bridge, this golden or silver bridge, to find a way out that will not cause violence and to have quite clear the vision of the day after, and continue to press, by all means, except military means. I agree with you. Uh, President Trump uh, suggested to me, well, why not a military intervention? I said, Mr. President, that would be the worst of all options. And I said, <laughs> and he said, why? <laughs> and I said, why? Because uh, maybe you go in and. Uh, you bomb whatever and you go out, but you le will leave a scar in the whole of Latin America in the relations with the U.S. that will take three or four generations to heal. And in the case, because he said, well, why don't you help us? I said, uh, because Colombians go in and uh, then we will be the enemies of Venezuela for uh, all our lives from now onwards. This is a very bad idea. Uh, Thank you for saying that. <laughs> 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 and, and also, there are certain factors that, that are, are facts, not alternative facts or real facts. <laughs> uh, for example, since the Chavez days, using a, the Cuban model, they have been arming militias to defend the revolution. And today, we have more than one million Venezuelans with AK-47s, Kalishnikov, under their beds, ready to defend the, revolu the revolution. Venezuela has not been a country like Colombia has, that has been accustomed to violence. Colombia has been a very violent country since our independence. We have been, Colombia has been the country with more 
civil wars in the history of all of Latin America since our independence. Venezuela, no. And if there is a violent transition, uh, the million uh, refugees that are in Colombia could in one week or two weeks become three or four or five million. Uh, it would be a disaster. So we have to continue insisting in a peaceful transition. I believe that as any decision in life, you have to uh, have the right conditions and the right time. I think the time is now to uh, identify those conditions because the regime is collapsing. Every day the w situation is worse. Um, the people are really uh, materially dying of hunger. Uh, we see it every day with what is happening in our border. There's also something that has not been very much publicized, the echo side, the, the environmental disaster that is happening in the other side of, of the border with the illegal mining and the drug trafficking um, is, is terrible. This, this, is, uh, this is contaminating already the big rivers of, of, of the region. Anyway, th this is something that is collapsing. We need to act fast. I would say press more. Um, the United States has one other card that could play and should play, which is stop the flow of oil from Venezuela to the U.S. That's their only source of income. The U.S. has not used that uh, card. There's a controversy of uh, the effectiveness of this. I think personally that it would be a, a card that should be used and should be continue to press uh, the Venezuelans, but also convince the other stakeholders, specifically China, Russia, and Cuba, that it is also in their interest a soft landing instead of a crash. Right. Thank you. I know you're going to get some questions on this. Quick last question. I have to ask you this. We talked yesterday. You served with two American presidents, the odd couple of American <laughs> politics, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. How did, you, how, did you, how did you work with them both? What did you think of them both? Did it go well? <laughs> <laughs> Not trying to get you into trouble. I'm just <laughs> no, no, they're, they're very different, I must yeah. say. <laughs> <laughs> and with, with President Obama, we, we made a, a, a click, a positive click since the very beginning. Um, I remember when he called me to congratulate me, I had never, I had never um, talked to him before, and he made a joke. I, I went uh, in my undergraduate uh, studies to the University of Kansas. Kansas has the best basketball team of the nation. Of the course. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> President Obama uh, said, hey, uh, the Jayhawks, the Kansas uh, are called the Jayhawks, um, lost a couple of days ago. I bet on them. Next time they're going to lose, let me know so I can save some money. So he <laughs> made a joke. And so, so he sort of broke the ice. And I said, oh, Mr. President, now that you are talking about my education, do you know what the conservatives say, the ultra-conservatives say about my education? And he said, uh, what do they say? Well, they say that I was educated in Kansas, Kansas is quite a conservative state, and corrupted in Harvard. <laughs> uh, um, we then became very good friends. For example, he had the courage, this is important, to accept in the Summit of the Americas to start uh, a discussion of an alternative way to fight the war on drugs a war that has been going on for 45 years and uh, has not been won. You still see uh, Trump saying, we have a crisis with the yeah. drugs. Yeah. Why, after 45 years of waging a war and not winning it, why don't you think differently? Like the Canadians did yesterday. They, they legalized the marijuana. 
Yeah. Uh, maybe it's not the best, but it's an alternative. What the Portuguese are doing. What anyway? Uh, Obama. We became good friends, and we clicked, and he helped me a lot in the peace process. With Trump, I've met him twice. Um, he's very different, uh, very difficult. Uh, uh, the conversation uh, to I had very long conversations with uh, with uh, President Obama, and very short conversations with Trump. In the sense that hmm. he uh, he he was very nice. I'm gonna say he was yeah. very nice. He said uh, good things about Colombia, um, but. But they are very different. I mean, the the character are, are they're we've, very different. We've noticed, and and their <laughs> and their policies are very different. <laughs> uh, and, and I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much for being so open and so honest with us. Um, we have microphones here. First come, first serve. The only stipulation. Please let us know your name, what you're studying here, if you're a student. And why don't we go right here first, please. Santos, it's a pleasure to have you here. My name is Luis Cespedes. I'm a junior at the college and president of the Colombian Student Association there, the proud son of a caleño. And I'm interested to hear your thoughts on the most recent presidential election in Colombia. Were you surprised that it came to a runoff and what does it mean for peace in Colombia now? No, I was not surprised. Um, I think uh, the result of the election is a result also of the peace process. Uh, the uh, the left in Colombia had always had the phantom of the FARC and the guerrillas uh, sort of revolving around them. And when this disappeared, the, the left had much more protagonism in the elections. I think that what is happening in Colombia, unfortunately, is what is happening all around the world that the center is weakening and the extremes are gaining strength. Um, I was talking to the president of the university, of the Harvard University yesterday about how Harvard and many universities should try to find a way to uh, re-strengthen the center uh, and to make politics more uh, what they were before uh, a matter of transactions, not black or white. And so Colombia is no exception to what is happening all around Latin America and all around the world. Um, the peace process, uh, the new government had uh, say, said many times that they were going to change the, the, the agreement. Uh, even They even said they were going to tear it apart. They can't, or fortunately they can't. W we created the conditions for this process to be irreversible. Uh, and uh, the implementation is going along quite well. As a matter of fact, yesterday, a very good sign, the budget that was approved in Congress, this government increased the amount that they're going to dedicate to what they call the implementation or the post-conflict. That's a good sign. And I hope that uh, they continue because there are two phases. One is peacemaking, which we already did. The other is peace building, the reconciliation. The Pope, who was a very good ally in this process, I invited him many times to Colombia. And he said, I will go but I will go when you most need me. And he went after I signed the peace process. And he went and he himself put the title of his visit. I go to Colombia to push the Colombians to take the first step in the process of reconciliation because he knew and he knows how difficult that is. And this is the process that we're going through right now. He, uh, wounds of 50 years of war don't heal from one day to another. They take time. And I say that reconciliation is like building a cathedral, brick by brick. It takes time. And we're in that path, and I hope that we will continue. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, how are you doing? I'm Ricardo Sutherland. 
um, from MIT uh, Sloan School of Management, and it's truly an honor uh, to hear both of you speak today. Uh, I'm a proud first-generation Colombian American. Um, both of my parents are from one of the predominantly Afro-Colombian regions, uh, Buenaventura and Buenaventura, yeah. El Choco. And um, obviously, like a big fan of uh, all of the peace agreement and everything like that. But those areas where it's predominantly Afro, Latino, and indigenous communities, those are two of the hardest hit areas in terms of like the poverty level, um, very under-resourced. Um, so given everything that you've spoken about uh, in terms of like peace agreements and how you prioritize certain areas, um, even though that group is uh, still in, in a really difficult situation, how do you think about that and, and how do you think about the complexities of, of figuring out a solution for some of the issues that are faced in those areas as well? Thank um, you. In the agreement, uh, one of the uh, ambitious uh, parts of the, of the agreement was identifying certain areas to have a sort of affirmative action there in terms of development. And we agreed to uh, plan these uh, and to, to design and create these development plans with the communities. And what we established was this will be made in the first two years until the end of this year. We, the plans are, have been, been consulting with the communities, more than 1,800 different meetings with different communities. The plans are ready and they should start being executed uh, after the uh, early next year. We gave ourselves 15 years to implement these plans. Buenaventura, Choco, which uh, you very rightly say are two of the areas where the poverty is the highest, where this type of development uh, efforts are most needed, are at the top of the list. and. Uh, we have had also tremendous uh, security problems because that's, those are corridors for the drug traffickers. Buenaventura is a corridor. Uh, Choco is also a corridor. And uh, so we have to make a better effort also, securing better the area and bringing investment, which was before very difficult because of the war. Uh, even the the, the, the the, the road to Buenaventura, Buenaventura being such an important port, the road had not been uh, correctly built because of the war. So that's one of the priorities. Thank you very much. Yes, please, right up here. Thank you so much. Thank you, President Santos. My name is Jose Barreto. I study at the Harvard Business School uh, doing my MBA. So my question is a two-prone approach. Basing on your history, and you've studied in the U.S., you went back to Colombia to work in the public sector, um, how, what advice would you give us, uh, Colombian, Colombian citizens, to go back to the country, especially in the case like with, with Luis Fernando Andrade, who did a very successful career at McKinsey, and then he led the infrastructure project. He hasn't taken any bribes, and he's facing severe legal um, punishments. By, by the Colombian government. How can, one, what are your thoughts on that case specifically of Andrade? And two, what advice would you give us to try to contribute back to the Colombian uh, country and make it better? Okay. Well, I have been very sorry. It has hurt me a lot. He was one of my stars. He was responsible of creating a marvelous institution that has allowed us to do a real revolution in terms of infrastructure in Colombia. Never before, I'll give you one number. Since our independence, Bolivar and Santander, to 2010, we had constructed uh, 780 kilometers of highways, of, of what we, we call dobles calzadas, the sort of, uh, highways in both ways. Yeah. During these last eight years, we have constructed 1,400, double of what we had in accumulated during all the history of Colombia, and that was responsible. The responsible for that is 
Lani and Luis Fernando Andrade. That's why I, I was so sorry to see what uh, was happening to him. We've been trying to, um, to uh, demand a fair trial uh, to say, he ha I am sure he has not stolen one single peso. Of that, I am absolutely sure. He's an honest man. So I hope that in the end, justice will prevail. And the advice I would give you, study hard and go back soon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so normally we would end at this time, but we have so many people who want to ask questions. And in America, we say we're going into extra innings because we're a baseball sure. country. And the Red Sox are playing tonight, by the way. <laughs> uh, and in Colombia, you say extra time. When is Colombia going to win the World Cup? Well, <laughs> speaking we, of we, football, we, we, we have we have a good a good football. You've got a great team, great football team. Yeah. yeah, we have high aspirations. Good. <laughs> we do too, but we're a little bit behind you. <laughs> we, we 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 were very sorry to beat the U.S. Uh, so, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, just a week ago. When was it? A week well. ago? Yeah. Yeah, we are uh, not in a good place right uh, now. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't remind you of the score because I'm. Yeah, please, because you're a polite per <laughs> diplomat. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, sir. Thank yes, you very please. much. Um, my name is Baktos Mustafa. I'm a German researcher at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And I wanted to ask you um, in your most difficult times, where you're almost in the, at this point where you, were, where you wanted to give up, um, what did you do practically? Um, to stay in your line and to keep this maybe hard, but in your opinion, right way. Do you have maybe a practical advice to all of us here? I will tell you something that has to do with Harvard. You were asking me what has Harvard given me. Uh, it gave me a lot of things, but a professor of Harvard, I think he has been teaching at the Kennedy School, Heifetz leadership. Yeah, he's still teaching. He's a great professor. He, w he went to Colombia. I met him many years before, but uh, he went to Colombia when, we, when I was starting. And uh, he said to me, you're going to take a very, very difficult decision and you're going a very difficult path. You're going to find all kinds of obstacles and all kinds of problems and you might not make it. And you will need to re-energize yourself because many times you will be ready to throw in the towel and say no more, which happened many times. And he said, the way to re-energize yourself is talking to the victims. I said, what do you mean? Yes, tell the victims to tell you their stories. And so I started doing that like I, I tried to jog a lot. Uh, I had, I'm quite disciplined from uh, days of, of the Navy. And so I started, as a matter of discipline, talking to a victim every week. And you cannot imagine the effect that that had on me. The stories of those victims, what happened, uh, how they uh, killed their daughter and how they raped her before, and uh, uh, one that all the family, there's one victim, 32 members of their family were blown up. He was by himself. Uh, and all of them telling me, continue, President. I thought, I thought that the victims were going to be the harshest, the, the, the most difficult, because they were the ones that suffered the more, the most. And uh, they taught me a big lesson that for me was extremely important that no, it's the contrary. They were the, the most generous, much more prone to forgive than the people who did not suffer in the war. So talking to the victims and, uh, and interpreting their drama as uh, a way to persevere was f very, very important. That's one of the ways, one of the many ways I maintained uh, the course. We'll tell Professor Heifetz that he had that, that impact. I, I mentioned beautiful this story in the in the in the speech of the Nobel Prize. I mentioned Professor Heifetz. It was very. He then said, "I'm very happy that you mentioned." Me. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he was. <laughs> <laughs> He's one of the most popular professors at this school. One of the most effective, great professor. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Miroslava Gungadze. I'm a Neiman Fellow, so 
your colleague, hopefully. Um, <laughs> uh, my question is um, two in one, basically. Uh, thank you, first of all, for your fantastic leadership lessons uh, that you are teaching us here. And um, my question is related to your personal and professional life. You were a journalist, uh, you were a minister, and you, from journalism, you uh, went to government and become a president. How did you make that decision and why did you make that decision and what drive drove you to that decision? And this, in the second realm of this question, you use this metaphor of uh, sailing uh, when you started speaking. So uh, what would be that point you were going for? Was it the position or was it that idea that you were sailing to? Thanks. When I was offered a a position in the government, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, of, of, uh, uh, of trade, of foreign trade. Okay. I had almost determined that my career was going to be journalism. I was born in a family of journalists. My f father had been a journalist. My grandfather had been a journalist. I was born uh, with the uh, order of ink and the newsprint, and th that was my world. And I had a very important uh, mentor, very wise man. And uh, I went to him and I said, uh, I've been offered a marvelous position in government. Uh, in my family, we had a rule that you could not have a revolving door. If you go out of the, of the newspaper, you won't come back. So I was going to sacrifice something very important. But this old wise man said to me, you will be publisher of the newspaper and you will have influence all your life. But that is different from having power. Power is signing executive orders that get things done. And you're a doer. I know you, I've been watching you for a long time. You will be happier, even though it's much riskier because being a journalist is more comfortable. And I tell you because that's true and you know it's true. Uh, but if you want to be happier in life, at the end of the life, of your life, switch. You're a doer. Go into politics, go into the public service. That's how I made the transition. The second question was... Uh, sailing and the point you're sailing oh, to. Well, I spent some, some time, uh, for example, whether I really liked journalism. I was, I was not a bad journalist. I, I, uh, I'll, I'll tell you an anecdote about journalism because it's relevant today. I was member, I was the chair of the Committee for Freedom of the Press of the Inter-American Press Association. And I went to Nicaragua back in 1985 to defend uh, a great woman called Violeta Chamorro because his, her newspaper was being censored by the Ortega brothers. And I went there and the extreme left of Nicaragua were very dissatisfied with the Sandinista revolution. They say that was a, a farce. They are a bunch of corrupt people. And they start giving me information, very valuable information. And um, I start writing a series of chronicles about the Sandinista revolution. Uh, where there were four big chronicles. Um, and uh, suddenly, some months later, I received a phone call and they say, who is it? The, the King of Spain. I, th I thought it was some, some, some friend of mine joking. And tell, him, tell him I'm busy. <laughs> no, I said, no, no, it's the King of Spain. And I cannot be the King of Spain. It was the King of Spain. And he said, <laughs> you have just been awarded the first uh, international King of Spain prize in journalism for the Chronicles in Nicaragua. And the day after, I was considered persona non grata by the Ortega uh, <laughs> uh, brothers in Nicaragua. <laughs> anyway, 
uh, I didn't know what I really wanted to do. Should I stay in journalism? Because I, I like public life. I, I lived in London for 10 years. I, I used to go to, uh, to hear the debates in, in, the, in the British Parliament. I loved, I loved politics. And what is it that I want to do? So uh, I went into politics. And, but there, uh, I didn't really know, have that port of destiny and the, what I told you about uh, peace, having a cause, a purpose mm -hmm. in your life. Uh, I sort of found that now I have a cause, a purpose, something to fight for, something to try to achieve, and that for me was extremely important. And this is something that I, that I advise all of you to do. Uh, try to find a goal, try to find uh, an objective, uh, and, and, and fight for it, and, and, and don't, uh, don't uh, get the, uh, discouraged, you fail. You, you stand up and, you, and, you, and that's, that, that makes life much more interesting, much more exciting, and much more fulfilling. I wish we could stay for hours, <laughs> but we only have time for two more questions, so with apologies, we'll ask your question and yours. I just wanted to say Ambassador Fidel Sandogorta from Spain is right here. He's with us all year. Oh, He'll, you've made him very happy, the story Thank about you. the King of Spain. Please. Presidente, muchas gracias por estar con nosotras. Um, my name is Daniela Philipson. I'm a second year master in public policy student. I am from Mexico, a country that has similarly been torn by violence and by organized crime. President-elect Lopez Obrador has said that he will put forth a process of peace and transitional justice. What advice do you have for President-elect Lopez Obrador? What should he do? What, more importantly, what shouldn't he do? Good question. Uh, it's very difficult for me to give advice to, to President Lopez Obrador, but I will tell you one thing. You cannot give criminals who are uh, shooting people for profit, uh, drug traffickers, a political connotation. You can give the guerrillas that they started fighting for a cost. Maybe they became uh, drug traffickers to finance the war, but I have always separated the two. With criminals, you don't negotiate uh, these type, these type of uh, peace process, uh, as a matter of fact, is not allowed uh, legally, internationally. You need to declare there is an internal conflict, an internal political conflict, in order to be able to uh, avoid the international uh, penal court to uh, intervene in your country and, and uh, in order to, to abide by the Statute of Rome. So, uh, with drug traffickers, you do what Colombia has done. We have been very effective. The problem is that we were effective. You all uh, have seen the uh, serious narcos. Um, um, we have been very effective in bringing those all-powerful drug lords down. But the business continues. As long as you have uh, the consumption here in the US and in Europe and in our own countries. Um, there'll be a supply. But that's why I say that we should work together better to have alternative ways of fighting the drug problem. But with criminal bans, drug traffickers, it's more law and order than a political negotiation. Thank you for your question. Last question. Thank you very much. My name is Jonathan Garcia. I'm from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, Colombian. Um, well, first, I want to just say uh, thank you for, for not giving up. I, I really thank you for that, for, because it was difficult and, and you didn't, so thank you for that. Uh, but my question was, like, you're famous not only for the peace process, you're also famous for implementing your government with Mr. Minister Alejandro Gaviria, one of the most modern pharmaceutical policies in, in, in the continent, and hopefully you can teach about that too here in the U.S., because it's important here. Um, but that decision was a subject of a lot of international pressure. So I remember uh, Switzerland, for example, was not very happy about that. The US and, for example, Vice President Biden wrote a letter 
about inviting you, rethinking about uh, your policy on biosimilar drugs, uh, and mentioning also the peace process uh, support. So my question is, like, how did you deal with those situations where you have to advance on different policies that were not related to peace, but that might have impact the peace process and the support of your international allies on that one? So just curious on that, and thank you for supporting the pharmaceutical policy, uh, because that has made a lot of Colombians get access to very affordable uh, medicines. So thank you for that, too. Well, thank you. <laughs> you, uh, you all are in the best place to understand the contradictions of many decisions that you have to take in in public uh, life in, uh, and in public policies. Um, and you, you mentioned one which, for me, it was a, a permanent uh, uh, source of friction, even with our allies like the US, uh, with Switzerland, with all the countries that produce medicine, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, what we did was uh, install a, a, what I define as a, a justified logical price control. Um, because we discovered that the same medicine in Spain could be 10 times cheaper than in Colombia. Uh, and the pharmaceuticals, uh, in a way, ab abused the, their, m their power uh, in terms of the market. And, and our health system, uh, the, the uh, f finances of the health system in every country are a matter of concern. Uh, the health systems are uh, getting more and more expensive as the population gets older and lives longer. And so you have to start controlling the cost of the health system in order to be able to uh, afford a good health system. We even have a constitutional court who was very generous and made some rulings about giving very, very expensive uh, treatments to many uh, patients, and that in the long run uh, could be counterproductive because that could break the system. But this friction, uh, we have to deal with it with diplomacy, with uh, explaining to the US uh, government, listen, I'm not going to change my policy. Don't press me more because I'm not going to change it. Uh, why don't we m more uh, uh, talk about something else on this issue? On this issue, there's no way we can we, we, we will we will concede. We don't think we should concede. We think that uh, the truth, which is something that here in this university is very important, the veritas, veritas. Uh, is with us. And uh, so, because some pharmaceuticals uh, are pressing you, doesn't mean that you're going to. Uh, um, press us for millions of Colombians not to afford X or Y medicine. Uh, this is uh, the constant uh, diplomacy that you need to exercise and hopefully effectively um, during the course of any government or any international situation. Uh, contradictions of that sort appear every day. President Santos, we've learned a lot tonight and we're inspired by your leadership. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.